Good evening and welcome to Fox News Tonight. Thank you for watching. Ron DeSantis does not have the biography of recent GOP nominees for president. He was born and grew up in Florida, but his family was not famous, not steeped in finance or politics. They were decidedly middle class. His mother was a nurse. His father installed television boxes. He attended public schools, played in the Little League World Series, and did well enough in the classroom and on the baseball diamond to make it to Yale University, where he captained the baseball team. While at Yale, he signed up for the Navy, served in uniform in a number of capacities, and stayed in the military until shortly after he became governor of Florida. And as governor, he led Florida through the pandemic, earning praise from the right and derision from the left. And the people of Florida seemed to like his first term. He was reelected in overwhelming numbers last fall. And today he announced his candidacy to be the next president of the United States. And he joins us now for his first television interview since that announcement. And we will keep him longer than most guests so we can ask him about his plans for the country as well as how he will address the issues confronting our culture and our country. I can't promise you that I won't crash, but Fox News will not crash during this interview. Governor DeSantis, I, if you broke Twitter, my daughter and the Kardashians are going to be very upset with you. I, I don't know if that's what happened with Elon Musk or not. Maybe you just had a big audience. We had a huge audience. It did. It was the biggest they'd ever had. It did break the Twitter space. And so we're really excited with the enthusiasm. But ultimately, it's about the future of our country. Uh, Trey, I'm running uh, to lead a great American comeback. We know the country's on the wrong track. We see it with our eyes. We feel it in our bones. We see the border being overrun. We see crime infesting the cities. We see the federal government making it more difficult for families to make ends meet. And we have a president who is a listless vessel, uh, not energetic, and not dealing with the key challenges that are facing our country. But it does not have to be this way. Our decline as a country is not inevitable. It is a choice. And I think we can choose a better pathway. And so what I will do is help restore normalcy to our communities, uh, integrity to our institutions, and sanity to our society. Truth needs to be the foundation of everything we do, and common sense can no longer be an uncommon virtue. We proved it could be done in Florida. We chose facts over fear when it wasn't popular. We chose education over indoctrination. And we've chosen law and order over rioting and disorder. Uh, if we can do it there, we can do it for the country. And the pledge I'll make for people is simply this. Uh, we need to win again as Republicans. We got to dispense with this culture of losing. And if you nominate me, uh, I pledge to you that on January 20th, 2025, at high noon, that I'll be the guy on the west side of the Capitol uh, with the left hand on the Bible and the right hand in the air taking the oath of office as the 47th president of the United States. No more excuses. We've got to get this one done. And anybody that's so inclined to help us, I would love to have your support at rondesantis.com. If you make a donation, maybe we can break that part of the Internet as well. Governor, you anticipated my first question, which is why. My second question would be, why now? You, you are very young in terms of political years. I don't even think you're 45 yet. So why now? And what distinguishes you from, from the other candidates? Are there policy differences or is it more about electability and how you would implement those policies, even if you agree on them? Well, why now? I think it's because the country's going in the wrong direction. If we have another four years of the Biden administration, uh, I think some of the damage is going to be irreversible. Uh, I think we have an opportunity now, kind of like the late 1970s when Jimmy Carter was president, uh, to really move the country in a much stronger direction uh, and really bring a lot of bold leadership to bear. Uh, why me? Well, I think what we've been able to do in Florida is two things. One, we've had unprecedented policy success. All the things that we believe as Republicans or as conservatives, for many, many years, we've been able to take those values and those principles and actually turn them into reality. Every single day, we put up big wins on the board, but we're doing that 
while also enjoying major political success. You alluded to it. We were able to win re-election by a historic margin, over 1.5 million votes. And you can't do that in a swing state like Florida just by getting Republicans. We were able to win counties like Miami-Dade County, which had voted for Hillary Clinton by 30 points in 2016. We not only won it, we won it by double digits. We are in 60 percent of the Hispanic vote. Uh, we won independence by 18 percentage points. And now, for the first time since the Civil War era, there's not a single Democrat elected in statewide office in the state of Florida. you got to be able to win. And then when you get in office, you've got to be able to deliver results. And I think we've been able to do both of those as good or better than anybody in the country. All right. Speaking of delivering results, uh, if you were to become the president, one of the first issues you would confront is inflation. Uh, what would you do about inflation? And do you believe it is linked to deficit spending? And can deficit spending be addressed without addressing mandatory spending or what people call entitlements? Of course, the overspending is driving inflation. I mean, if you go back to March of 2020, you've seen massive amounts of debt added. You've seen the Federal Reserve print trillions and trillions of dollars. Anybody knew at the time, and people like our friend Thomas Massey were screaming from the rooftops at the time that it was going to lead to persistent inflation. So you need to spend less money. You also need to expand domestic energy production. Energy costs contribute to inflation. We have an abundance of resources here that this president doesn't want to use. So we will reverse Biden's energy policies very quickly. But we also need a Federal Reserve that's going to focus on maintaining a stable dollar. They should not be the economic central planner uh, for our country. They're not accountable to anybody. They're not elected by anybody. And yet their printing of money has really thrust us into this. They said there wouldn't be inflation, and yet here we are. Now they've been hiking interest rates, and that hurts the economy. So we need a Fed focused on a stable dollar, uh, and don't worry about trying to manipulate the rest of the economy. If a candidate for the Republican nomination or president says, I can balance the budget, I can restore fiscal sanity, and I can do so without touching mandatory spending or what others call entitlements, should that person be believed? <laughs> Well, Trey, you know the math. I mean, at the end of the day, we're spending so much more, and it's a combination of, of both. I mean, there are some spending programs that are on autopilot that Congress doesn't even touch, and those have grown dramatically. You have also, though, seen a huge increase in what they call discretionary spending. Certainly in the last four or five years, Congress is spending at levels that you and I couldn't have even fathomed you know, back in the day. Uh, so I think it's a combination of all these things. You know, right now we have a situation where Joe Biden is refusing to do really anything uh, to try to limit uh, how much money is being spent. And I think he's been singularly irresponsible in terms of how he's handled uh, the federal budget. All right, Governor, people hear words and sometimes use words like woke or culture wars. What is the role of the president in participating in culture Wars and, and, and I'll ask you specifically about education because many conservatives think that's a state issue, but that's also a battleground for what people call woke or culture wars. As president, what role do you play? I know governor, but as president, what role would you play? Well, first of all, the woke mind virus is basically a form of cultural Marxism. At the end of the day, it's an attack on the truth. And because it's a war on truth, I think we have no uh, choice but to wage a war on woke. So how does that work for a president? Some of it may be the bully pulpit, being willing to tell the truth and not being deluded by ideology, which we see in many aspects of our society. There are probably ways, though, that you can make a difference. Certainly when you look at ESG and some of the things that's going on with major financial institutions in corporate America, we have every right to be pushing back on that. With education, you know, the federal government approves the accreditors for universities. There's a reason why universities are infested with things like DEI. Yes, yeah, some of it is they may want to do that, but some of it is the accreditors tell them you have to do that. Well, as president, I'll make sure we're approving accreditors uh, that are going to do the opposite, They're, that are going to say, you know what, we're going to credit you if you are a colorblind university, if you're not trying to divide people uh, on the basis of race. So there are different tools at your disposal. It's not the same as, the, as, a, as a governor, uh, but I think you can have an impact across a wide variety of different areas. 
You know, Governor, when I think of dangerous places, I think of uh, Sudan, North Korea. Uh, I don't think of Florida. I don't think of a travel advisory as it relates to Florida. Uh, I'm going to let you take us to our first break by, by letting people know that it's okay, it's safe to travel to Florida despite what the NAACP, uh, and I believe the chairman of the NAACP may actually live in Florida, so maybe his house is for sale. But I'll let you take us to the break yeah. by addressing the travel advisory. It's a typical political stunt. Um, first of all, Florida's crime rate's at a 50-year low. Compare that to places like Chicago or Baltimore. I don't hear the NAACP talking about that. If you look at our education system, you know, we have school choice. That's one of the reasons why our black students perform as high as just about any black students in the country. We're second and third in fourth grade math and reading, respectively, because parents have options. You go to Baltimore or Chicago, some of these kids are more likely to get shot than to actually have a high-quality education. I don't hear the NAACP talking about that. So we're proud of what we've been able to do. And, oh, by the way, Trey, quarter one of 2023, Florida set yet another tourism record. And I can tell you, since I've been governor, some of the people who've contributed to our record tourism have been board members of the NAACP. How do I know? Because they've put pictures of their Florida vacation on their social media accounts. So this is an attempt to create a phony narrative. But I think people are onto this stuff. They know what it is. Uh, and they take it with a grain of salt and they dismiss it. Governor Ron DeSantis, we're going to be right back after a quick break and we'll have more conversation with the governor. And that's coming up. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.